Hollywood, California, the Lux Radio Theater presents Edward Arnold and Anita Louise in Silver Dollar with Marjorie Rambo. Lux presents Hollywood. Silver Dollar is the drama of an amazing career, a story of sudden and enormous wealth, and the devotion of two women for a grocer who became king of the Colorado silver mines. Our stars are Edward Arnold, Anita Louise, and Marjorie Rambo. Our music is directed by Louis Silvers, and tonight's special guest is the daughter of William Jennings Bryan, Mrs. Ruth Bryan Owen Rode, former congresswoman and United States minister to Denmark. This program comes to you with the good wishes of the makers of Lux Flakes, those gentle, thrifty flakes that are known to women the world over. But I wonder how many of you know this about Lux. The economical large size package of Lux holds about 400 teaspoonfuls of flakes. And just think how much they'll do for you. A little goes so far, Lux is thrifty, really thrifty. Why, just a few teaspoonsful of Lux will do a pair of stockings or a slip or a dress. A little more does dishes for a whole meal and helps your hands stay lovely into the bargain. Remember, Lux is safe and it saves. So buy the generous large size box tomorrow and use it for everything safe in water. Your silks and woolens, your rayons and colorful cottons, and your dishes. And now, we bring you your host and producer. Ladies and gentlemen, Mr. Cecil B. DeMille. <laughs> Greetings from Hollywood, ladies and gentlemen. Forty years ago this month, they buried in Mount Calvary Cemetery in Denver a man who at one time was as rich and as famous as many kings. Today he's all but forgotten. His memory scattered, just as the bits of granite that were once his tombstone are scattered in the weeds and grass of an abandoned graveyard. A telephone exchange in Denver is named after him, but apart from that, little is left to recall the fabulous figure of Horace Austin Warner Tabor the man whose life is the basis of our play. Silver Dollar is the drama of the whirlwind that struck Colorado with the discovery of silver, following as it did right at the heels of the state's equally incredible gold rush, when, when ladies dressed in the finest gowns mingled with Indian squaws clothed in shaggy buffalo robes, when the first school was opened by an Irishman named Goldrick, who came into town with a silk hat, broadcloth suit, and kid gloves, driving an ox team when a church and a gambling den shared the same building, when the smallest coin was a quarter, when kerosene brought three dollars a gallon, peaches a dollar apiece, and Julesburg, Leadville, and Cripple Creek were the treasure chests of the nation. What riches did to Horace Tabor, judge for yourself when you hear the play, for Tabor lives again in the character of Yates Martin. This amazing story was told in celluloid by Warner Brothers. We bring it to the air, starring Edward Arnold as Yates, and Anita Louise as Lily. Mr. Arnold was taking a, a well-earned rest in New York when our call came. A real trooper and a sincere friend, he dropped everything in favor of tonight's performance. The accomplishments of Anita Louise extend far beyond the realm of acting. This beautiful young star speaks three languages, performs ably on the piano and harp, is a splendid dancer, the composer of numerous songs, and has a Scotty named Wee Thistle. 20th Century Fox Studio stars are currently with Shirley Temple in The Little Princess. The second celebrated lady of our cast is Marjorie Rambo, back with us in the role of Sarah Martin. We're off for Colorado now, as the Lux Radio Theater presents Edward Arnold and Anita Louise in Silver Dollar with Marjorie Rambo. Less than a hundred years ago, the territory that is now the state of Colorado was a vast mountain wilderness. Then came the magic cry of gold. And into this virgin land roared hard-faced, hard-drinking miners who established the boom towns where a man's life was worth no more than the gold in his pocket. And the only law was a blazing six-shooter. In the St. Charles Saloon and Miners Resort, one of the evening's gun battles has just been settled. A tall man in a frock coat enters the hall and 
bangs on the table with the butt of his revolver. Quiet. Quiet, everybody. Shut up, you men. Colonel Stanton's going to make a speech. Quiet, quiet. Now that the entertainment is over, Slick here has allowed us the use of his hall to discuss something of importance to every citizen of St. Charles. That right, Slick? That's right, Colonel. We can't have any more shootings and killings around here. St. Charles has a bad reputation from coast to coast. First thing you know, people will stop coming here. And then where will we all be? It's about time we had some law and order. Yes, sir. In the first place, most of us seem to feel we ought to give this town a new name. Give us a clean start. How about it, boys? Any ideas for a new name? Paradise! The Milky Way! I like St. Charles. Mr. Chairman, if you don't mind, I'd like to take the floor. Well, you can have it, Yates. If Slick there don't mind, I'm buying Slick. Who is that fella, Slick? Yates Martin. He's a farmer from Kansas. I knew him back in Vermont when he was a stone cutter. Now, folks, uh, about renaming this town, I like... I like, like St. Charles. And if any man in the joint wants to settle it right now, I'll meet him outside with my brass knuckles. <laughs> Well, there ain't no doubt about how Poker Annie votes. Sure <laughs> Thank you, Miss Annie. Now, I don't aim to contradict the lady, but there ain't no saints in St. Charles. <laughs> what with six killings last week and two on Sunday. Nobody minds shooting a claim jumper, but killing a man in broad daylight on Sunday is going a bit too far. Yeah, right. We men of Kansas, and there are plenty of us here... We men of Kansas think mighty well of our Governor General James W. Denver. Now, what do you say we call this town Denver? My friend here, my friend Yates Martin proposes Denver. All in favor? Well, folks, that's fine. Now we ought to drop rules and regulations and a constitution. And we got to elect a temporary mayor and sheriff. What about Yates Mark? Sure, Yates Martin for mayor. Well, it's all yours, Yates. The first mayor of Denver. Go ahead, Yatesy. I'm with you. Well, my friends, I, I hardly know what to say, but it looks like the drinks are on me. <laughs> Boys, <laughs> you're going to see things around these parts. You're going to see a city. Cities all around here. You're going to see an empire that's going to make those places back east look like villages. And that ain't no dream. I got 300 acres back in Kansas, but it can rot for all I care. Yates Martin is after gold, and there's enough in these mountains to bury us all in gold caskets. And, uh, uh, oh, let's forget it. I'll buy you all another drink. Come on. Oh, my darling. Oh, my darling. Oh, my darling. Oh, my darling. Well, come in, Yates. Or do you expect to stand there all night? Huh? Yes, it's me, your loving wife, Sarah, and this is your son, Mark. Oh, hello, Sarah. Hello there, Mark. <laughs> He's learned to talk already, huh? The smartest kid in Denver. You had a little too much to drink, Yates. Oh, no, just a couple with the boys, sort of organized things for him tonight. I'm uh, going to make this place a real city. The fact is, you ought to be very proud of me. I know. You were elected mayor. How'd you know? Every time we stay in a place more than two days, you're elected mayor. Well, uh, <laughs> I'm just a natural-born leader. You can certainly lead the charge to the bar. Ah, oh, now, Sarah. What? But in the meantime, there's just $20 between us and starvation. I told you we'd come to grief. We should never have left Kansas. What, Sarah? We're going to be rich. Well, what have you done so far? Bought two worthless claims. Salted mines. We've wasted our time and spent all our money. Oh, Yates, what's going to become of us? Now, now, don't worry. You stick with me and we'll be buried in gold caskets. Meanwhile, by the grace of Providence, we're still among the living. Well, but we don't always have to stay here in Denver just because I'm the mayor. We can move on to better claims. The boys tell me there's quite a strike up around Leadville and... Oh, uh, Yates... Are we going to drift around all our lives? Well, we got to until I strike it rich somewhere. Then we'll, well, then we'll stay put. But maybe there won't be any gold in the new place. Yates, I've been thinking about something else. What's that? 
Haven't you noticed that it isn't the men who, who dig the gold who are getting rich up here? It's the men who sell them things. Well, you mean saloon keepers, huh? No, no. Yates, why don't we open a little store? I haven't told you, but I kept a couple of hundred dollars hidden to take us back to Kansas. We could use it to open up a store. Me? A storekeeper? Oh, you'd make a fine merchant. Huh. Hey, Yates Martin, merchant. You know, I kind of like that. Maybe I could open up in Leadville. You'd get along in business, too. Oh, why not? Abe Lincoln started by splitting rails, and, and Yates, Ma Yates Martin will start by cutting bacon. Now, how about it, Mark? <laughs> That's it. Well, all right, now let's count the buttons. Rich man, poor man, beggar man, thief, doctor, lawyer, merchant. <laughs> Let's see, boys, that makes 36, 20, and two sacks of beans is 48, 75, and 12 pounds of bacon is... Uh, 15 is... pounds of bacon, Yates. Uh, 15, is that right, boys? You should say 15, it must be so. Well, then that makes $64.50, yummy, boys. You have said it is not today we must the bill pay. Then we have kicked the gold. Oh, yeah? sure, sure, that's all right. Yates Martin trusts you. And then we pay you everything. I'll tell you what I'll do, boys. There's two of you and one of me. That's three of us. You give me a third of everything you find. How's that? That is very good. Good. We give you one third part of all the gold. Ah, that's fine. Go ahead, boys. Take the stuff along. <laughs> we all win or lose together. That's right. Goodbye, eh? Goodbye, goodbye, Rich. Goodbye, goodbye. 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 <laughs> goodbye. I guess that's right. Oh, now, Sarah, what do you want to fuss about three pounds of bacon for? I don't suppose it makes any difference. <laughs> we won't get paid for it anyway. Well, why do you have to talk like that all the time? Everybody around here is trading with me. We've got to trust people and take a few chances. That's business. As soon as they come back with their gold, we'll be rich. But they're not coming back. You grubs take everybody in Le Leadville. Then they move away. Oh, wait till somebody makes a strike and they'll all start bringing it in. Then you'll see what I mean. It's like bread on the waters. Yes, dear, you can have some more. Father's a big man, so his little son can have some more beans. Oh, now listen, Sarah. We had beans yesterday, Mom. Yes, dear, and the day before. But we won't be bothered with them much longer. They're almost gone. Then Mama's little man can eat some of the nice bark off the tree. Oh. I don't want bark. I want bacon. Well, so do I. Last summer we had some bacon, but your father gave it all away to tramps who said they were looking for gold. Now we can't buy any more. Now listen, everybody has their ups and downs. Our ups are coming. They're not coming, Yates. We're just getting poorer and poorer here because you're too stubborn to quit. Everybody else is going. Oh, please, let's go back to Kansas. We still own the farm. Farm? Show me the farmer who could dig gold out of potatoes. But you're not digging it out of anything. All I can see is a lot of that worthless black rock. And a book full of bad debts. I came to these mountains to get rich so we can we could be somebody. Oh, I know you did, Yates. And you've tried hard. But we can't get rich where there isn't any money. We have all our old friends back in the East. And you were starting to get ahead in politics. Now, that was better than this, wasn't it? Well, yes, I suppose it was. You'll go, won't you, Yates? Oh, uh... oh I'm so glad. Well, since it's on your account we started the store, I suppose I ought to help you get out and get out of the hole. Oh, yes. <laughs> We're going, Mark. We're going home. <laughs> Who can that be? Somebody trying to get in the store. At this hour? I'll go and see. No, no, I'll go. Oh, it's you. Good evening. Herr Martin is here. I'm sorry. Mr. Martin is busy. We haven't anything left, anyhow. It is not to get food they are come. It is to show something. Look! Hmm. I guess we've seen plenty of that black stuff. What? But you don't understand. Hello, boys. What's up? Ah, Herr Martin, we bring news. Look, thousands and thousands of tons like this have we find. Well, it shows you've been working anyway, boys. Keep it up and you'll find something yet. Wait. You know what is this stuff? Well, is it worth anything? Worth anything. We have sent by St. Louis to smell to some of the pieces. It is worth for the ton $800. What? what? $800 a ton? 
It was here all the time and we didn't know it. Millions of tons everywhere. Deeper down is more rich or the earth. And for you is one third, as is agreed. I knew there was gold here. We are rich, sir. Gold. No, no, it's not gold. It's silver. Silver? Well, what do I care? It's the same thing, only it's spelled different. The little Pittsburgh mine, richest in Colorado. And Yates Martin has one third? Worth a fortune. Well, I guess that solves our problem for the mayor of Leadville. Yeah. I was thinking the same thing. Ma, do I have to wear these sissy clothes, Ma? So it seems, dear. Your father wants you to look like a mayor's son should. Well, I'm a shrewd businessman, son, Ma. Who said that? Carl Warren. He says that's what father is. What's a shrewd businessman, Ma? Well, sometimes it's a man who's had a lot of luck. Sit down, Mr. Adams. Thank Take you. Seat, Mr. Thank you. Thanks. I may be mayor of this town, but I'm a storekeeper, too. What was that, Liddy? Two pounds of bacon? Uh-huh. Yes, sir, Mr. Mayor. Two pounds, eh? Yes, ma'am. Uh, Yates, uh, Mr. Adams came up from Denver to see you. It's pretty important. So is this, ain't it, Liddy? Mm, we ain't had our supper yet. <laughs> you see, boys? Hey, uh, here you are, Liddy. All right, Mr. Martin, all right. Go on, cut bacon, if that's your ambition. All we wanted was to ask you to run for lieutenant governor. Huh? Well, what say, Yates? Lieutenant governor of the state of Colorado? That's what we're talking about. We need the Lake County vote. And the boys agree there's only one man can swing it. Now, you've been mayor here for pretty near four years now, and your record's clean as snow. Well, Yates, well, you used to have a tongue. Oh, sure, sure. <laughs> hey, uh, Sarah, Sarah, Mark, Sarah, Sarah. Yates, Yates, what's the matter? Uh, Sarah, I, I'm, I'm, I'm governor, Sarah, governor of Colorado. Oh, it was lieutenant governor we mentioned, ma'am. But I don't understand. Well, we're just asking him to run, ma'am. The election ain't over oh, yet. Oh, don't worry about that. I'll leave it to the boys. They, they all know me. You can go back to Denver and tell them that Yates Martin is with them to the finish. I just organized a fire company here. New uniforms, hose carts from Chicago and all that. All at my own expense. That'll get every vote in the country. That's fine. And furthermore, I just bought a new mine. Yates. You bought another mine? Yep, $50,000 I paid in dirt cheap. A bigger paying mine than the little Pittsburgh. And if I'm elected, I'll give half the profits to the state of Colorado. To the people of the state of Colorado. Uh, that's right, the people. Wait a minute, Yates. Who did you buy this mine from? What was his name? Oh, now, Sarah, business is men's business. What was his name? Why, uh, uh, uh Frankel, I think. Frankel? That man who came in here last week, that miner? Yeah, sure. Oh, Yates, you fool, you poor lumbering fool. Sarah! That man has skipped town. He stung everybody in the place with salted mines. Fake. What? Most of them were stung for just a few dollars. But no, not you. Oh, no. You had to give them 50000 Now, No, no, wait. I, I've got men working that mine. And what have they found? Well, nothing yet. But... And that's all they'll ever find. Nothing. I don't believe it. Ask your friends. Ask Mr. Hamlin. Well, Hamlin, do you know anything about this man, Frankel? Well, <clears throat> well, he has left town. But well, you've got more important things to do, Yates. Don't worry about it now. Now, that's right. The lieutenant governor. Yes, giving away half the profits of a salted mine. Oh, Mrs. Martin, your husband had a very good point there. And since the voters don't know the mine is worthless, I, uh, well, I don't know why we should inform them. I said it before I knew it was worthless, so I can say it honestly now. If I'm elected, I'll give half the profits to the state of Colorado. The people, Yates, always the people. Yeah, that's right. I'll write that down so I don't forget. The people of the state of Colorado, yeah. <laughs> I'm here, Ma. Gee, Ma, what are you sitting in the drawer for? The election's over, Ma. Papa's elected. You ought to be glad. I know. But it doesn't seem right somehow. We, we don't belong here. Of course we do. Pop's one of the biggest men in the state. Listen to that crowd, all cheering for him. And for us, too. Why, things are going great, Ma. I know. But I'm afraid. Your father's had too much luck. We're just living on luck. Trying to be great folks when we're only Kansas farmers. Oh, Mark, you're Mama's little boy, ain't you? You'll always be my little boy, won't you? You won't never forget your Mama, whatever happens, will you? 
Will you, Ma? What's the matter, Mama? Ain't you feeling well? Oh. Oh, I'm all right. Run along. Run along. Well, folks, well, folks, this is a great day for me, and I hope that during my period in office, there will be greater days for us all. Anyway, I thank you, each and every one. And when you come to Denver, look me up. I may be lieutenant governor of the whole state, but I ain't forgetting old Leadville. You know that from what I told you about the new mine I bought, half the profits... <laughs> Hey, Mr. Martin, I gotta see Mr. Martin. Here, what do you want? Excuse me, Mr. Hamlin, but I gotta see Mr. Martin right away. I'm the foreman of that mine he was just talking about. Oh, well, uh, well, there's no use to see him now. Well, what's the trouble here, Stoney? Well, I didn't want to interrupt the party, boss, but I thought you'd like to hear the news about the mine. Oh, yeah, well, I guess you don't need to dig anymore. Oh, yes, we do. We kept on just like you said. Struck a vein 50 feet down. Smelter folks say it's the richest rock they've had yet. What's that? Yes, sir. Struck ore running 1,800 a ton. Oh, as good as that, eh? Better than I expected. Better than you expected? Why, boss, you know I told you that mine was no good. Keep quiet. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen... Ladies and gentlemen, it may interest you as friends of our lieutenant governor to hear that his shrewdness and foresight have again been vindicated. We have just heard that the claim he purchased to help out an unfortunate prospector has turned out to be the richest mine in the whole Leadville district. And I'm keeping my promise. Half of all I get goes to the great state of Colorado. Yates. I, I mean to the people of the great state of Colorado. The curtain falls on Act One of Silver Dollar, starring Edward Arnold and Anita Louise. During our brief intermission, we bring you the Browning family. We find the two girls, Dot and Midge, in the kitchen doing the dinner dishes. Their pretty southern cousin, Cynthia Ann, is with them. She's visiting the Brownings right now, and Dot and Midge find some of her ideas very strange. Here, Dot, let me draw the silver, honey. Okay, here's some waiting for you. Oh, there goes a fork. A man's coming as sure as I live. What in the world are you talking about, Cynthia Ann? Why, Midge, honey, if you drop a fork, it's a sign a man's coming to cold. Well, what a superstitious gal you are. Anyhow, the fork's got to be washed again. Here, give it to me. I declare, honey, I think you're awfully brave, doing dishes every day. Brave? Why, what do you mean? Why, Mother says a lady must always have nice hands, and dishwashing's so terribly hard on hands. <laughs> My, you do have funny ideas, Cynthia Ann. We use Lux for our dishes. And, honey child, that Lux is just too, too wonderful. <laughs> what Midge means, Cynthia Ann, is Lux makes perfectly grand suds, and they're just wonderful. And they leave our hands looking real ladylike, too. Well, Cynthia Ann is learning a thing or two. It's easy to do your dishes with Lux and still look like a lady. There's no harmful alkali. No, absolutely nothing in Lux Flakes to dry the natural oils in your skin. Seems kind of foolish to use harsh soaps when Gentle Lux is so kind to your hands. And it's fast and thrifty, too. Yes, a little goes so far. Lux is thrifty, you know. So keep the generous large size box in the kitchen where you'll have it handy for dishes. And now I see Mr. DeMille is ready to raise the curtain on the second act of Silver Dollar. Act two of Silver Dollar, starring Edward Arnold and Anita Louise with Marjorie Rambo. As lieutenant governor of the state of Colorado, Yates Martin grew richer and more expensive than ever. Silver is his god. And out of the great warehouse of his mines come lavish gifts for his constituents. Now he's building an opera house, the finest that silver can buy. The lobby is almost finished, and Yates inspects it with the contractor. And on these pedestals, we're going to put butts, uh, statues of all the great writers and composers. Composers, huh? Uh, that's the idea. Uh, we could put uh, Goethe here. Uh, he wrote Faust, you know. Oh. And it, it might be appropriate to have some of the others put up, like uh, Schiller, Moliere, Sheridan, or, or if you prefer, a composer like uh, Beethoven. Uh, uh, how does that sound to you, Governor? It sounds terrible. Who are those fellas, anyway? <laughs> Say, what's so funny about this... Oh, I beg your pardon, miss. I... Oh, I'm just looking the place over. 
Do you mind? No, no, of course not. Go right ahead. Thank you. <laughs> Mighty nice looking girl, ain't she, huh? Uh, uh, Governor, about those statues. Now, uh, Goethe and Beethoven. I never heard could... of them. And I don't think anybody around here is interested in a bunch of foreign names. Put up my friend Hamlin and Abe Lincoln and Pistol Pete and General Grant and, and Poker Annie and have her with a cigar in her mouth. <laughs> oh, what do you think, miss? <laughs> Did you know who all those foreigners were? Oh, no. But I think any lady who smokes cigars deserves a statue. Oh, sure. Besides, Poker Annie means something to Denver. I never heard of her. Oh, you must be a stranger in town. I've only been here a week. You were the only one I'd heard of back east. Oh, is that so? Uh -huh. Well, uh, well, I... Uh, uh, say, contractor, what's that picture over there? Oh, uh, uh, that's to go over the proscenium march. It's uh, William Shakespeare. Shakespeare? What did he ever do for Denver? Uh, well, uh... Well, nothing. That's what he's done. I'm paying for this place, and I'll have it done like I want it. I tell that man working on that inscription there that I want it in English, like I said. Nobody in Denver can read Latin. Uh, I told him, Governor, but he insists it should be in Latin. Well, then I'll do it myself. Where's his tools? You've got to do things yourself if you want them done right around here. Yes, sir. And I'll tell the architect about the picture right away. Oh, uh, excuse me, miss. Uh, a person sure has his hands full attending to all these things. You must be an awfully busy man, running the Senate and taking care of everything yourself. Oh, I find time for everything. It seems as though you do, even uh, cutting inscriptions. Well, you see, I used to be a stonecutter in Vermont, and I'm going to do this so as people can read it. <laughs> you, uh, you've been here long? I told you before, a week. Oh, oh <laughs> gosh, <laughs> of course, that's right. <laughs> Are you figuring on staying sometime? Oh, I might. Of course, I'm, I'm not settled yet. You all alone? I am now. My husband was, well... Oh, I'm sorry, ma'am, I... I imagine it is kind of hard, a woman being alone. Well, it, it does take a man to get a new house fixed up. Yeah, it sure does. And, well, maybe uh, I could sort of lend a hand. Eh? You? Well, that, that's awfully nice of you, but oh, I couldn't. Oh, sure you could. Why not? Oh, that's fine. Just the right place for the mirror, don't you think? <laughs> yes, I guess it is. <laughs> My, wouldn't people gasp if they knew the governor of Colorado was helping me move? I'm so thrilled. Oh, that's all right. Nobody's business but ours. How do you like that frame? You know, that solid silver? You've been wonderful to me. I, I can hardly believe it at all. Uh, we're just getting started, Lily. Wait till the opening of my opera house. You've got the best box in the house right across from me. I'll never take my eyes off you. Ah, no, 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 be careful. You know, General Grant's going to be sitting with me. Imagine, Yates Martin, the ex-president of the United States. <laughs> I'll be sitting and talking to him just like I'm talking to you. It's wonderful. You know, General Grant knew Lincoln personally, and if you're a good little girl, well, maybe you'll meet him. I don't know why you should be so good to me, but you do like me, don't you? Oh, sure I like you. Sure I do. Will there be anything else, Master Mark? No, that's all, Henry. Where is my mother, please? Uh, in her room, I believe. Thank you. Mom! Gee, Mom, I thought you'd be dressed. You better hurry. I don't think I'll go, Mark. Why, you've got to go. It's the opening of Papa's Opera House. General Grant's going to be there, and he was the President of the United States. I know. Where's your father? He's gone already. He had to meet General Grant. Mama, ain't you going to get ready? No, honey, I ain't going. You run along and tell your pa that I got a terrible headache. I think he'll understand. Well, I wouldn't go without you, Ma. Now, don't you worry about me, Ma. I'd just rather stay at home. Why? Everybody's going to be there. Oh, please come, Mom. You do love your ma, don't you, Ma? Sure I do. Well, be a good boy then and go. Well, goodbye, Mom. Goodbye, honey. Fine place here, Mr. Adams. Yes, and no burden to the taxpayers either. Yates Martin paid for every stone. <laughs> <laughs> Yates Martin built this old friend, a great man. 
There he is. There's Yeats Martin. Way for Yeats. Stop the music. Stop the music. Stop it. Ladies and gentlemen. Ladies and gentlemen, I've seen Denver grow from a mining camp to a city of 30 or 40,000 people. And I said if Denver is to have an opera house, it should have one worthy of this city. You can look over the opera house and see if I've done my duty in this you respect. But, I, but I'm going to do something more. I bought this whole block, and the other half of it I hereby give to the United States government as a site for the finest post office in the United States. <laughs> Wonderful tonight, Yates. I've never seen you so wonderful. Well, it was some show, all right, huh? me and General Grant. You know, he was a farmer, too, just an ordinary person like you and me. <laughs> he never thought he'd be president of the United States. But he was a hero. Ah, the war did that. <laughs> <laughs> and maybe the show we gave him tonight will do that for me, too, huh? You know, make me a sort of a national figure. It certainly should. You know, they're already talking about running me for the Senate. The Senate? Mm-hmm. Oh, that's marvelous. Well, the experience might do me some good. But, darling, what's going to become of me? Why, everything is going to be fine. You hardly even looked at me tonight. Well, sure I did. I had your box put right across the way from mine, didn't I? I'm always across the way from you. Oh, like to be nearer, eh? Huh? Oh, Yates, you're so fine and strong. I want you to be all mine. Well, uh, Lily, I'm arranging things the best I can. You've said that for so long, Yates. I'm tired of all this secrecy. Well, I've got to be careful, you know. Why? You're the biggest man in Denver, in Colorado. Nobody can hurt you now. Oh, I know that, but they warned me that if I was to be United States Senator, I got to be careful not to let the women get talking. If there was a divorce, they'd take her side. Those people can't do you any harm. You've enough real friends. Besides, she won't make you any trouble if you give her enough money. Ah, uh, no, 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 no. It ain't like that. She don't want anything more than she's got. But it's going to bust her all up. But how about us? You've got to do it sometime, Yates. It isn't right like this. We love each other. Hey, Lily, well, what can I do? You know what to do. Speak to her tonight. Yates, it can't be wrong. Not when people are really in love. And I love you, Yates. You're mine. Lily. Lily. Yates. Yates, is that you? Uh-huh. Why, Yates, what's the matter? Oh, nothing. But you're packing your things. Are you going on a trip? Well, I'm... I'm going to the Windsor Hotel. Windsor Hotel? What for? I'm going to live there. But why? What's the matter with this place? There's nine rooms here you ain't never been in yet. Well, it's, um... It's everything about it. I'm, I'm moving. I'm not living here anymore. And, and what's to happen to me? What's to happen to Mark? Oh, you'll be taken care of. You can get a divorce. Yes. I'll give, you, I'll give you the house. I'll give you anything you want. And that makes it right, I suppose. You'll give me money. Did I ever ask for money? Am I one of your properties to be bought and sold whenever you feel like it? You'll give me money. Well, what else have I got? Yes. What else have you got? I'm, I'm sorry, sir. I'll do anything for you. You know that. Well, I'm going to live here anymore, and... Well, I'm leaving you, that's all. Yates, look at me. Is it that girl? Yes. Yes, I knew it was. You're leaving me for her, ain't you? Well, that's why I want you to stay. Not only for me, but for you, too. You won't be happy, Yates. You can't. You can't buy happiness that way. Please don't go, Yates. Stay here and let me look after you, like I always done. Oh, please, Yates. I'm sorry, Sarah, but I, I can't. I'm sorry. Yates! Yates! <laughs> The 
Station identification. This is the Columbia Broadcasting System. Come to the end of Act Two of Silver Dollar, starring Edward Arnold and Anita Louise. In a moment, during our intermission, we introduce our guest of the evening. But first, a word about our product. You know, with skirts up to 18 inches this year, stockings are more in the limelight than ever. And it's certainly no time for ugly runs and snaky seams. Now, here's a suggestion for keeping your stockings lovely looking longer. Lux them after every wearing. Lux Flakes saves the elasticity, you know. Lux helps your stockings stay nice and springy so they fit superbly and don't pop into runs so easily. That's a good thing to know, isn't it? And remember, a little goes so far, Lux is thrifty. Mr. DeMille. Tonight's play is a tale of pioneering. And we have as guest a woman who has pioneered in many fields. She's the daughter of William Jennings Bryan, who, as a neighboring Nebraskan, intimately knew the country and the people of our play the first woman to represent the Old South in Congress, the first woman to occupy a seat on the Foreign Affairs Committee of Congress. Our guest is also America's first woman diplomat. From New York City, we now hear the Honorable Ruth Bryan Owen Rode, former United States Minister to Denmark. I'm very glad to be here, Mr. DeMille, and I assure you that the name of this play, Silver Dollar, brings back many recollections to me. It was not so long after tonight's colorful drama of the silver mines had been played in real life that there were political discussions all over the country about silver, although not everyone knew what was meant by free coinage of silver. One colored man, I remember, was heard to say, who wants three-cornered silver? A three-cornered dollar would tear holes in your pocket. Round money is good enough for me. Yes, silver was on every tongue, and I remember my father's tongue was called silver, too. The silver-tongued orator was the expression they used. It is good to look back sometimes and remember the America of yesterday. Not long ago, I was flying across our country from coast to coast over the Rocky Mountains, the scene of tonight's play, and over the western plains which the covered wagons had to cross. Between the dawn and dusk of one day, I traveled the distance which had cost the pioneers weary months of effort. Far below me I could see the cement highways like smooth gray ribbons stretching across the plains and winding over the mountains, and I found myself wondering if today's Americans who travel the highways remember those earlier settlers who smoothed their paths for them, who blazed the trails and endured hardships and faced perils in the doing of it. The day of the pioneer and the prospector has slipped away across the horizon of history, but we mustn't forget their story. Our mountains have been climbed now, and the fields planted and the roads built, but there are still frontiers before us, frontiers of knowledge about human living, and they demand the qualities of the pioneer and the patriot. The little frontier towns are no more, and the memory of the adventures lived in them has faded. But their men helped subdue a great continent which still rewards courage richly and lets men live in freedom. It was the cold of the winter and the heat of the summer and the hardness of the rocks with which the pioneers and the prospectors had to struggle. And faith in America and in the destiny of America gave them the will and the spirit to conquer. And faith in America's destiny guides us across each new frontier today. With the help of women like you, Mrs. Rohde, a nation faces the future unafraid. We're in Hollywood again, where Edward Arnold and Anita Louise continue in Silver Dollar with Marjorie Rambo. <laughs> Blindly, Yates Martin rushed into the future, buying his way at every turn of fortune. But now the separation from his wife has alienated the voters and he sees his dreams of a senatorship rapidly fading. Now the public ought to be ashamed of themselves after I've all done for the city. I gave away millions. 
Listen here, Hamlin. I didn't get sore about you not running me for governor again, but I'm going to be a senator if it's the last thing I do. Well, I can buy the whole legislature if necessary and make them dust off my chair in the Senate chamber, too. Well, it's not our fault, Yates. We want to run you, but you wouldn't stand a chance with the voters now. Well, that's mighty funny. You know, if, uh, if you could only go back to your wife, Yates... Oh, there is no go. use of that. It's all over with. I was figuring on getting married to Lily in Washington and have the president at my wedding. The girl and I sort of planned on it. Say, you know, that part might be fixed. Uh, Hamlin, who's taking Senator Teller's place? Uh, Chilcott. What's that? Uh, Senator Teller has been made Secretary of the Interior, and the governor appointed Chilcott to fill out his term. It's only for 30 days, though. Well, why didn't he appoint me? Well, that's what I'm getting at. You know, maybe we could get the governor to send you instead. Well, sure. Would I be a real senator, a seat in the Senate and all that? Mm, yes, for 30 days. Well, that's all right. That's all I want. Mrs. Yates Martin granted divorce, $250,000 settlement. Ex-governor appointed United States senator for term of 30 days. Senator. He always wanted that. Beautiful, it's gorgeous. Oh, well, it better be. That necklace cost me over ninety thousand dollars. I expect even the president'll sit up and take notice. Is he sure to be here for our wedding? Oh, he promised. So did most of the senators and congressmen. And their wives? Well, not all of them. You see, it's like I don't see. Who do they think they are? Oh, never mind them. You know women. There ain't one of them can show a ninety thousand dollar necklace, and they don't like to come around where other women are wearing them. Why, we can give them the cold shoulder. <laughs> think of it. Me, Yates Martin, United States Senator. <laughs> Started in the stone quarry in Vermont. Cleared off brush in Kansas, dug in the mud in Colorado. Then built opera houses and business blocks and donated land for the government's post office. <laughs> and now I'm marrying the most beautiful woman in the world. With the President of the United States and most of Congress for my guests. And it's only the beginning, little girl. Oh, Yates, I'm so happy. Ah, you will be happier, too. Did you see what I bought for you this morning? Look out the window to see those birds. They're very nice. What are they? What are they? Oh, they're white peacocks. They're worth their weight in diamonds. Oh, oh, Yates, you shouldn't spend so much. Oh, say, remind me to show you what one of the boys on my paper wrote about me. He says I'm like the king who touched things and they turned into gold. What's his name? King somebody, you know. King Midas? Yeah, yeah, yeah. He said, I'm just like King Midas. Only everything I touch turns to silver. <laughs> I beg your pardon, Senator. Yes, that's all right. What's the matter? Congressman Bryan is calling, sir. Bryan? Yes, William Jennings Bryan from Nebraska. Oh, yes, yes, yes. He wants to speak to me about silver. Excuse me, Louis. Hi, Mr. Bryan, come in. Thank you. Senator Martin? That's right. Glad to see you, Congressman. Sit down. You're interested in silver, you say? Immensely. Well, you've come to the right place. Look what silver's done for me, for Denver. <laughs> My chief interest now is the future supply. Future supply? Young man, there's enough silver in those mountains around Leadville to build a solid silver wall 40 feet high across the eastern boundary of Colorado. Well, that's what the gold men in the east seem to think. They believe there's too much. Too much? Oh, that's rich. How can there be too much of a good thing like silver? There's going to be a big fight, Senator, during the next few years. A sharp battle between the gold standard men of the East and the silver men of the West. And one or the other will go down. Then let the gold men go down. We're building our empire on silver. They can't scare me. I'm not trying to scare you, Senator. I merely want to get some facts on the probable supply. And also warn you that they'll do whatever they can to demonetize silver. What's that? Reduce its value. Oh. Make it worth half as much, possibly. Well, then we'll dig twice as much. Simple. We know what we can do with silver. I've always told these boys here, stick by me, and you'll be buried in a solid silver casket. <laughs> <laughs> well, now that that settles, we'll have a drink. <laughs> What's yours? Grape juice. Huh? Daughter born to Mr. and Mrs. Yates Martin, christened Mary Ann Silver Dollar, Echo Honeymoon Martin. Silver Dollar Martin. Silver Dollar Martin buys newspaper. Great holdings increase. Silver Dollar Martin on Railroad Board of Directors. Former Senator said... Senator Martin buys huge estate, one of the richest men in the world.
Kids, I've been waiting up for you. What's happened? What is it? Lily, I'm broke. Gates. Well, you can't be. I, uh, I don't understand it. I don't see how it could happen. They, they took everything. Except the matchless. My own bank busted. They wouldn't let me have a cent. There must be some mistake. I had $12 million, maybe more. Now everybody says I owe them, and they... They won't wait. They're going to sell everything I got left. Everything? Our house? Our house, Yates? They say so. And the white peacocks? Everything. Everything we got. But you'll stick by me. You'll stick, Lily, won't you? Don't leave me now. I can't be alone. I can't. Yates. Yates, my darling. Do you think that's all our love means? Of course I'll stick. Thanks, Lily. Thanks. Mr. Martin. What is it? There's a lady here, sir. She says she must see you. I told her it was impossible, but... Where is she? In the drawing room, sir. I'll see you. Hello, Yates. Sarah. Sarah, well, it's been a long time, hasn't it? Well, what can I do for you? Yates, I've heard what's happened. I thought maybe I could help. <laughs> help? No, no. I know you've had trouble. And, uh, well, you gave me quite a lot of money. I invested it, and there's a lot more money now. And I thought I could give some back. Ah, that's mighty nice of you, Sarah, but <laughs> I don't need no help. I lost a little money in silver, but I'm not broke. No, sir. Silver's coming back again, and I still have the matchless mine. And a lot of things. I can take care of myself. I always have, haven't I? Hmm. Yes. Oh, yes, I, I hope you'll be happy. Same to you. How's Ma? He's going to get married. Going to get married? Well, goodbye, Yates. And good luck. Good luck, Sarah. Grocer. Grocer, Mrs. Martin. Just leave the things on the stoop, please. I'll give the bill to Mr. Martin. Well, I, I'm sorry, ma'am, but I was told you'd pay me today. It's twelve eighty-six for two months. Well, Mr. Martin will pay you tonight. Oh, gosh, the, the boss told me not to leave nothing un unless you paid me, but I, I guess it's all right. I, of course I, it's all right. I guess things ain't too good since you got back here to Denver, Mrs. Martin. Maybe if Please. Mr. Just leave the things there. Yes, and... Is that somebody for me, Lily? No, darling, just the grocer. Oh. He I wants see. his bill. Uh -huh. Well, I guess I better get after that. Kind of slipped my mind. Any mail today? No, no, nothing. Were you expecting something? <laughs> sure. <laughs> I've been holding it as a surprise, but <laughs> they're going to make me postmaster here. Postmaster? Oh, Yates, that's wonderful. Yeah, sure. We'll be on, <laughs> on top again. You see. It's just like I always said, stick to me and we'll all be buried in silver caskets. Hey, clerk, uh, have you got anything for me today? Any letters? Well, what's the name? Martin, Yates Martin. No, not for any Martin. No letter from Washington? I said there wasn't anything from any place. That goes for Washington and Honolulu and Omaha. You're going to be a mite politer to the citizens next month, young man. Not as if you're still here. I well, built this post office and I built that opera house down the street. Yates Martin is my name, Silver Dollar Martin. Well, I'm sorry, mister, but there still ain't any letters. All right. Maybe it'll be here tomorrow. Hey, you, you can't go in there. The opera house is closed. Yes, I know. I I just wanted to go in and take a look at it. That's all right, isn't it? Just to 
Go in and stand on the stage a minute? Well, I guess so. Go ahead. Thanks. Thank you. This is mine. I built this place. I stood right here. General Grant in that box up there, and Lily and everyone all dressed up, cheering me, cheering There's something that tried to, to choke me. What's the matter? Lily. Lily girl, what's wrong? Come to me quick. I I need you. Where are you, Lily? General, General Grant, where's Lily? Stop it, stop it. What are they trying to do? Mr. President, find Lily. Tell her to stop them. They, they don't want me to be postmaster. They're trying to... Lily... I need you, Lily. Lily. Doctor. Doctor, tell me. Is there any chance? Any chance at all, Doctor? I'm afraid not, Mrs. Martin. Your husband's not young, of course, and it... Well, it's been too much for him these last few years. Oh, Yates. Poor Yates. Lily. Lily. Where are you? I'm here, darling. Right by your side. You're home now, darling. Lily. Don't forget. You know... Hold on to matchless silver. It's coming back. Yes. Remember, stick by me. Be buried in a silver casket. I'll stick it forever. Curtain Falls on the last act of Silver Dollar, starring Edward Arnold and Anita Louise. In a moment, Mr. DeMille brings back our stars for a curtain call. But first, I have a bit of news for the women in our audience. I was looking through a New York paper yesterday, and judging from the advertisements, most women are thinking of things like this. Easter coat suits and dresses foam with white. Wear starched lace cuffs and collar on your pretty Easter coat. Polka dots and bright prints give you a fresh top-of-the-morning look. Buy lingerie blouses like mad. Foamy white tucked batistes, crisp organdies and eyelet embroideries. Skirts flare and swirl to show yards and yards of embroidered ruffles on snowy white petticoats. Yes, this spring everything's designed to make you look fresh and feminine and flower-like. So don't forget to give all the lovely things you buy regular Lux care. You can count on gentle Lux flakes to take beautiful care of everything safe in water alone. To keep your things fresh and new-looking an extra long time. There's no harmful alkali in Lux to hurt delicate fabrics. So buy the foamy white things that fashion demands and be sure to keep the generous large size box of Lux flakes in the house to keep them delicate and lovely looking longer. Remember, a little goes so far, Lux is thrifty. And now, Mr. DeMille is ready to bring you our stars. Out of our saga of silver, step two sterling artists, Edward Arnold and Anita Louise. Well, Eddie... It doesn't seem to have changed him a bit. No, it's the same as ever. How does it feel, C.B.? Huh? How does what feel? Your election by the senior class of New York University as the most popular radio personality in America. <laughs> well, it, it rather overwhelms me. My, my reaction is one of gratitude and bewilderment, with some slight suspicion in your direction, Eddie. 
You just came back from New York, and as an ex-student of NYU, I, I wonder if by any chance oh, you... Oh, no, were... no, Columbia, sir, Columbia. And I only oh. know what I read in the papers. Hmm. Oh, I didn't know you were a Columbia man, Eddie. What did you study? Pyrotechnics. Huh? Yeah, for several months, I tried to learn how to keep the engines going for the boilers. In plain language, I was an oiler, till they canned me for overheating. Overheating? What? Heating? No, no, heating. Heat, not overheating. <laughs> I was under eating for quite some time thereafter. I've been trying to make up for it ever since. <laughs> but I'm sure our listeners, Mr. DeMille, are much more interested in the basis of tonight's play than in Arnold's exploits as a gourmet. Now, how much of Silver Dollar actually happened? Well, if, if your name in the play had been Horace Tabor instead of Yates Martin, I'd say most of it. But Anita knows quite a lot about old Colorado. Oh, no, not a great deal. But I know that Tabor still kept his job as postmaster of Leadville, even when his millions came rolling in. He supplied both post office and clerks. The miners were so anxious to get the mail that they paid from one to five dollars for the privilege of standing at the head of the line each morning. And I know that stars like Edwin Booth, Sarah Bernhardt, John Drew, Lillian Russell, and young players named Cecil B. DeMille and Marjorie Rambo acted at the Tabor Theater. That oh, wait a minute, wait a minute. I played there too, you know. And Edward Arnold. <laughs> <laughs> anyway... Tabor ran through his millions in 15 years, but still had the courage to go back to work with a pick and shovel when his last silver dollar was gone. Mm, good or bad, he helped bring culture to the Rocky Mountain region in its fledgling days. And while his opera house was probably his greatest achievement, no drama was ever enacted there, more powerful than the drama of his own life. And that's why it's been such a pleasure, C.B., to have taken part in reminding America of one of its forgotten builders. Many thanks. I'll be listening next week, Mr. DeMille. Good night. Good night, Anita. Ready? Your silver dollar is one of this theater's treasures. There's thrilling news awaiting you. Mr. DeMille tells you shortly about the grand program coming from this stage next Monday night. Heard in Silver Dollar were Joe Duval as Colonel Stanton, Forrest Taylor as William Jennings Bryan, Perry Ivins as Slick, Lee Millar as a doctor, Inez Seabury as Poker Annie, Lou Merrill as Adams, David Kerman as Kish, Walter White as contractor, Mary Lansing as secretary, Frank Nelson as Stoney, and Eric Bertis as Mark. Edward Arnold appeared through courtesy of B.P. Schulberg and Columbia Pictures Corporation. His new picture is Paramount's Man About Town. Louis Silvers is from 20th Century Fox Studio. He directed music for the new film, The Story of Alexander Graham Bell. Be sure to listen to the new Lux daytime radio program, The Life and Love of Dr. Susan. The story of a young and attractive woman doctor struggling to make life worthwhile for herself and her two small children. You can hear it over most of these stations in the United States every afternoon, Monday through Friday, at 2.15 Eastern Time, 1.15 Central Time, 3.15 Mountain Time, and 2.15 Pacific Time. This new daytime program, The Life and Love of Dr. Susan, comes to you in addition to the Lux Radio Theater. Here's our producer. We go next Monday night to a strange, mysterious land, a land like another world, ancient, Beautiful and cruel. The India of Rudyard Kipling, where a handful of soldiers patrol in the name of peace and the crown of Great Britain. A stalwart, exciting drama, tremendously successful on the screen. Our play is Lives of a Bengal Lancer and stars four of the brightest personalities in Hollywood today. Errol Flynn, Brian Ahern, C. Aubrey Smith, and Jackie Cooper. Our sponsors, the makers of Lux Flakes, join me in inviting you to be with us again next Monday night when the Lux Radio Theater presents Errol Flynn, Brian Ahern, Jackie Cooper, and C. Aubrey Smith in Lives of a Bengal Lancer. This is Cecil B. DeMille saying good night to you from Hollywood. Your announcer has been Melville Lewis. This is the Columbia Broadcasting System.